in chapter 5 of Galatians. So let's look at that. We left off in verse 6. Paul writes, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You see, circumcision uh, was the big thing in Paul's day. Today it's water baptism in our day. People, people were required to be circumcised and keep the law to be right with God in time past. That's not true today. Jesus Christ has a revelation of the mystery that Gentiles could be saved not by performing the law of Moses, but by faith in his shed blood. And Paul says, he, had to, he, had to, he says, your circumcision, whether you were circumcised as part of that covenant, Israeli covenant, or just an uncircumcised heathen Gentile, they all need to come and, and, and trust what Christ did on the cross, okay? So it didn't matter. When he says availeth anything, it doesn't profit you whether you are Jew or Gentile today. But in Christ, we're all one. We're a new creature. And he says in verse 6, look at the end, Galatians 5, verse 6, but faith which worketh by love. Now, it's not your outward religious expressions, the external works of your religion, whether it's water baptism or circumcision in Paul's day, but it's faith working by love. You know what Paul is saying there? It's your faith in what Christ did for you working, and the motivation is, not, is, is love and not fear. We're going to look at that. When Paul says, faith which worketh by love, that's the difference. See, in, in, in Galatians, he's dealing with the law. And the motivation of the law of Moses was fear. See, when, 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 an, when the Israelite thought about the law of Moses, the motivation to, to walk pleasing was fear. We're going to see that. Paul says that grace, grace is just the opposite. The motivation for the law was fear, but the motivation for the grace is love. Not your love for Christ, by the way. You know what keeps you from sinning? When you realize that the Lord Jesus suffered and died to pay for your sins and he set you free from sin so that you can now walk pleasing to God as you believe his word. The love of Christ we're going to see is going to be the motivation for your good works. It's going to be his word of his grace working in your mind and through your soul that motivates you. As the law of Moses motivated that, Israel, that believing Israelite by fear, okay? So when Paul says, faith which worketh by love, Israel's faith worked by fear, okay, under the law. We're going to look at that. He talks about faith which worketh by love. Hold your hand here and go to the book of Hebrews. Go to Hebrews chapter 2. The nation of Israel had the law of Moses. And what that law did, it says, if you do, I'll bless you. But it also says, if they didn't perform right, God would curse them with a curse. See, he doesn't deal with us today like that. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, Ephesians 1, verse 3. But Israel, in order to get the blessing, they had to perform. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, and let's look at verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, speaking of Christ, he also himself likewise took part of the same. The Lord Jesus Christ came and had flesh and blood. He was God in the flesh, came through Mary, a virgin. Now watch why he came. He also himself likewise took part of the same, Hebrews 2 verse 14, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. You understand? Under this law, Satan had lawful right to destroy Israel when they broke that law covenant. That's what they covenant. God would bless them, but God would use Satan to curse them, part of the covenant of the law. Jesus Christ came to fulfill that law perfectly and die for the sins of Israel. That, that new covenant of Israel was bought with his own blood on the cross. But Paul says, not just for Israel, a due time testimony, the apostle Paul says that Christ died for all men, for us Gentiles too. But look what it says about Israel in verse 15, Hebrews 2 verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You understand what that's saying? That as that Isra Israeli, Israelite walked under the law, he walked on eggshells, not wanting to displease the God of Israel, Jehovah God of Israel. And it says, they had the fear of death and were all their lifetime subject to bondage. This law was bondage because if you didn't do everything right, 
you could easily die and go to hell. Imagine having to live under that. Well, that's the law. They brought forth good works under the law. Their faith worked not by love, but by fear. Look at chapter 4 of Hebrews, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Let us, therefore, the writer of Hebrew writes to the nation of Israel, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Now, he's talking about the kingdom here. Look at the board for a second. In the future, although God has put aside Israel for a season, for a reason, the season is during the dispensation of grace. The reason is they're uh, rejecting their Messiah. God is doing a new thing. He's not dealing with the nation of Israel today. But one day he will fulfill his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israel, and give them their earthly kingdom. So if they wanted to enter into that rest, it's going to be a seventh millennial kingdom, that seventh day rest, okay? Look what he says. Verse 1 of Hebrews 4. Let us therefore fear. Let us therefore what? Fear. See this? They had to fear. What are they fearing? Lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Do you understand that these Jews were motivated by fear? And they're saying what we desire is to get into that kingdom. And they had fear that they might not get into that kingdom based on whether they obeyed God or not. Oh, my friend, God doesn't deal with you to, and I like that today. You know, we still sin against the Father sometimes because of this flesh. Praise the Lord that in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, having forgiven us all trespasses, Christ will never account another sin to you if you trust him, what he did on the cross. If you believe the Son of God, Jesus Christ, died on the cross to pay for your sins, God will never impute another sin to your account. That's the grace of God. Israel didn't have that. By fear, they were motivated. But that's not how he deals with us. Go to 2 Corinthians, if you will. 2 Corinthians 5. No, my friend, what motivates us, what makes our faith works, is not the fear of God that he would pound us if we don't do right. Oh, no. You know what Grace says? Look at verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. You know that word constrain, my friend? It means to motivate us. It, it literally means that it picks you up. His love picks you up and holds you. The thing that is the motivating thing of your heart ought to be his love. When you think that God commended and demonstrated his love for you and that while you're yet a sinner, Christ died for you, if you let that be the focus of your life as a believer, it will motivate you to do good works for the Lord. Not because you have to or you're scared that you won't get a blessing. It's in response to the fullness of the blessings he already gave you in Christ. You know, back here under the law, Israel was motivated to forgive others. Matthew says, if you forgive men, your heavenly father forgive you. But if you don't forgive men, neither will your heavenly father forgive you. They only receive forgiveness based on whether they forgave others. You know what Paul says today? It's not like that. Ephesians 4 verse 32 and Colossians 3.13 says that the way we forgive people is because we've already been forgiven. Get, look at the difference. Here you had to forgive in order to get forgiveness from God. Here you already are forgiven whether you forgive people or not. Now God wants you to forgive because it releases your soul. See, when you're, when you're holding unforgiveness against someone, that's a that's burden on your soul. And Christ says, the way I forgave you, you can forgive others. See, he sets you free from sin. But even if you don't forgive today, okay, let's get it right. Even if you are not ready to forgive at that moment, God will never keep forgiving. He already forgiven you everything up front, okay? That's the difference between law and grace. 2 Corinthians 5, look at verse 14. For the love of Christ constrained, it picks us up, it motivates us. Why? Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. I mean, Jesus Christ died for your sins, my friend. Verse 15, and that he died for all, that they which live, those people who live are those like you and, you and me. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, through faith in his blood that you have your sins forgiven, you believe that by faith, now you live. You have eternal life. Now watch what happens. What to do with it? And that, verse 15 of 2 Corinthians 5, and that he died for all, 
that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. From the moment you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought not live for yourself. You know, before you got saved, you were living for yourself. That, that didn't get you anywhere. Paul says in Romans 6, by you living for yourself in the flesh, the end of those things was death. That was the fruit thereof. Now you in Christ, you can bring forth fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. So let's look what he says, verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Okay, so if I'm not living for myself, who am I living for? But unto him which died for them and rose again. Oh, so now that I'm a Christian, now that I'm saved, my life ought to be dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ. You got it. See, you used to live for yourself. Now you're in Christ. Now live for him. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 16, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. You know, you don't look at a person after the flesh and say, oh, you're a Jew, you're a Gentile, you're black, you're white, you're male, you're female. That's not the issue. See, in Christ, we're all one in Christ. Yeah, we still have the distinctions, but in Christ, we all have the same blessings that the other person has in Christ. Let's keep reading. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth, know we him no more. My friend, what Paul is saying there, let's get, I want you to see this. Paul says, we have known Christ after the flesh. Jesus Christ was in the flesh in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's not how we know him anymore. Look what Paul says. Though we have known Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16, after the flesh. Yet now, here in the but now, in the present dispensation of grace, Paul the apostle preaches Jesus Christ not according to after the flesh prophecy, that which was made known through Israel's prophets, Paul says his preaching of Jesus Christ is according to the revelation of the mystery, something that God kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, Romans 16, 25. When we talk about Jesus Christ, it's not Jesus of Nazareth. It's not the Messiah of Israel. It's the Lord of glory preached by the Apostle Paul. We don't know him after the flesh. Look at verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? A new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Everything in this dispensation of grace that pertains to the God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost is new. It's different. Same Lord, same Spirit, same Father, different administrations. Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He's not doing this program anymore. It's the grace message, what God is doing today, and your understanding of it that will motivate you to walk pleasing to God because he shared his heart with you. God kept a secret, and he revealed it to you and I through the Apostle Paul. That ought to motivate your heart to walk pleasing to God. Go back to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. That's the motivation. It's as you renew your mind with grace doctrine, with what the Apostle Paul writes, and, com and, and contrast it and compare it to what the writers of the, the Hebrew epistles and the um, Jewish prophets and Moses back here, that you gain understanding about the Word of God. It'll motivate you to, to please Him, to serve Him. Look at chapter 5 of Galatians. Look at verse 7 and 8. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. You know, they ran well. What does Paul mean by that? You understand? The way these Galatians got saved is they believed Paul. Paul, as the apostle of the, of the Gentile nations, went out to the Galatians, these Gentiles, and says, Christ died for your sins. He's the Son of God. They believed him. They started off well. They believed what the apostle Paul said. You ran well, he says. And then look what he says. Who did hinder you? You understand? The reason I say, are you tired of the religious treadmill? It's because the Christian life is a walk, but it's a race. It's a course that you must walk or, or run. And you have to run it just like you, you run that marathon. You can't cut, cut out, take a cab and, to the finish line. You're disqualified. Well, the Christian life is that way. And the way you run the Christian life lawfully, Paul says, is by rightly dividing the scriptures, obeying what Paul says. They ran well. They started off right. But guess what? They didn't make any progress. 
You know, when you're on that treadmill, you can run as hard as you want. But if that treadmill's right here, I could stand here and you can run real hard, but we, we both went nowhere. No. That treadmill of religion, that's what religion is, a treadmill. Boy, you work hard, but you go nowhere fast. That was these guys. They ran well, but somebody hindered them. You know, when Paul says, who did hinder you? It was a person. You know, my friend, men came, preachers. Men who used the Bible, they used God's word. They didn't rightly divide the scriptures. They were biblical. They were nice and biblically based. They just weren't dispensational. They took what Paul says, and they mixed a little Peter in there, a little James in there, some, uh, you know, Isaiah, and they said, it's all for your obedience, and they confused them the way Satan wants you to be confused. Where Paul says, nope, you need to rightly divide what I say from the others and obey what I say. All the Bible is for us. God wants us to know Genesis through Revelation. Right here in our assembly, I'm teaching all the way through the Bible. But when I teach Genesis in Reve through Revelation, I tell you, that's not for your obedience back there. These 13 books of Paul are. Some men were coming in and hindered them. And they taught them not to obey the truth. What's the truth? The present day truth is what Paul writes. They taught them to leave their apostle Paul. Look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 1. Galatians chapter 3 verse 1. Paul says that when you allow someone to take you away from what Paul writes, you're foolish. Foolish thinking. Look what he says in chapter 3 verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians. Do you see the passionate with our apostle? You see something when he starts a passage with that, oh. It's like, oh. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who hath bewitched you? You let somebody come in and use some words, they cast a spell like a witch does, and they fool them. They fool them. That ye should not obey the truth. Hey, they got the truth from Paul. And somebody came and convinced them through wisdom of words and fair speeches and taking the Bible and, and like, like with the sleight of hand like a magician and mixed it all up and confused them. And they became foolish in their thinking. Cast a spell on them. See, when you allow men to teach you the scriptures, but they don't teach it the way that Paul presents the scriptures, rightly divided, they bewitch you. A person did that. You know, God had a program back here in time past to the nation of Israel. But when Paul came along, God had a new program. And what these men do, they pretend like nothing's different. They go, oh, there's just one gospel. It's all the same. Paul is just one of the 13. Oh, Paul is just, his, his gospel is just like John the Baptist, just like the Lord, just like Peter and the 12. It's all the same. When they do that to you, they got you. They bewitch you, cast a spell on you. They got in your mind and they, con they confuse you with God's word. Oh, no. God had a program to the nation of Israel and God had a program to the Gentiles. Go to Romans chapter 6, if you will. Romans chapter 6. How do you get out of that confusion? How do you get out of the being bewitched? How do you get out of those pe people who, who persuade you? Well, Romans chapter 6, look at verse 17. Paul writes, But God be thanked. Here's something you can thank God for. That ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. The way that you get out of the grasp of these men who confuse you with scriptures, they're biblical but they don't rightly divide, is you obey from your heart the form of doctrine delivered to you. And today, the doctrine that God Almighty delivers to you and I as Gentiles in the dispensation of grace is the 13 books of Paul to obey. 1 Timothy chapter 1, if you will. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul tells Timothy the same thing. Timothy was a preacher in Ephesus. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse 3. Paul tells Timothy, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no 
other doctrine. And my friend, in the context, you read 1 Timothy chapter 1, men were coming, doing what they did in Galatia. They were being, look, look what he says in verse 7. 1 Timothy 1 verse 7. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they are firm. When, don't you let anybody tell you that the law of Moses is, is the most important thing for you to believe today and you to be under the law. Paul says we're not under the law, we're under grace. The doctrine that Paul gave us to obey is not the law, it's grace. And these men desire to teach the law. And you know what he says? God sees in their heart that they understand, they understand neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Basically, they're confused and they don't know nothing. They don't know a thing about God's word. They don't understand what God is doing today. They may know a lot about time past and the ages to come, but when it comes to what God is doing today for your edification and education, they have no clue. Paul says, teach no other doctrine. 